Hey, Liz, everybody is in. All right. All right, guys, welcome in. Are we, we're going to wait a few more minutes, though, I assume, right, Jim? To, or do you want to just get started? Uh, we are at 7.03, so it's been a few minutes. I'd get started. Okay. All right. Hello, guys. Welcome. Um, this is going to be the tournament director's training. Um, show you guys how to be volunteers or at least update you if you've already been one on how to do the um, procedures and such while you're out the field. Uh, so I thank you for attending. Uh, I'm Liz Berg. Um, I'm going to be running the meeting tonight. Jim Rose is our behind the scenes guy. He's going to be um, taking your texts. So um, as we start the meeting, um, just a reminder, keep yourself on mute. Um, we'll mute you if we need to, but uh, keep yourself on mute. If you have a question, put it in the chat. And there's going to be lots of places where we're going to um, uh, break for uh, questions and such. All right. Um, as we go down through, throughout the presentation, you're going to see um, different uh, logos. Uh, if you see that TOC logo there, um, that means that we're talking about only TOC. If you see the future stars, we're talking about only future stars. And then if you see the all-star, either the softball or the baseball, that, that'll explain to you which one we're talking about. Um, we're going to, if if it's something where the uh, the rule or, or the procedure applies to all divisions of all types of play, um, then it'll just be, sorry, forgive me, I'm tired, did a, did a grad night with my kids. So um, uh, anyhow, uh, Assume that uh, the rules apply to all four types of postseason play, um, unless it's specified otherwise. All right. So we're going to be certifying some tournament directors tonight, um, give you an idea of what's expected, what the duties are. Um, that's duties as far as paperwork, um, welcoming teams, field de decorum, what to do in the, in the case of an emergency or an event, and um, how to report the games in the end. All right. I'm going to keep going. It's a long presentation, so I'm going to skip through as much as I can. Um, this is tonight's agenda. The presentation will be made me be made available as a PDF at the conclusion of the meeting or soon thereafter. Correct, right, Jim? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. As I mentioned, unless otherwise stated, the slides apply to all divisions of postseason, both TOC, Future Stars, and All Stars. All right, there's our fearless leader. This is Ted Boet. He is our District Four administrator. Um, he also serves as the tournament director for all tournaments. The rest of our D4 staff, we have Mr. Jeff Shu, who's on. He's our ADA as well as our Little League Baseball ADA. Our umpire in chief, Don Waddell, is online. Carla Moore is our district safety officer. She's also here. Um, Grayson Lawrence is our teenage baseball ADA. Phil Rain, softball. Um, Steve Muhammad for challenger. Paul Roski is our Western Regional Senior Baseball Tournament Chair. Uh, Jim Rose, who's assisting us tonight, is our training coordinator and also the assistant UIC for softball. And then Candido Anasetti for uh, assistant UIC for baseball. younger, less tired picture of me. There we go. Um, let's talk about what each of these tournaments are, just so we understand. Uh, TOC is short for Tournament of Champions. Um, these are played under Little League District Special Game Regulation 9. Um, sole authority under California District 4, Ted Boet. Um, that means if there's any um, questions or policy, uh, we don't uh, advance it on to uh, Little League for determination. It's all made right here in the district. Um, those policies are set for by District 4, and it's it's a nice tournament. It's a tournament designed to um, reward those teams that place first in each of their divisions um, and their local leagues to come play against the other leagues um, in a final postseason tournament. DOC is a um, single elimination tournament, so unlike uh, All-Stars, which is double. All right. The game rules for TOC are um, regulation rules. Um, 
All right, District 4 and League rules for baseball and softball divisions apply and supplement the official rules. So if there's anything that District 4 has um, put into place, especially for these tournaments, um, we're going to let you know those. Um, so in other words, local ground uh, field rule, uh, ground rules don't apply, or sorry, local ground rules do apply um, with regards to fencing and such, um, but those will be covered at the plate meeting with your umpire and your team managers. Here are our divisions for baseball. We have our double A, triple A, those are both minors, the little league major division, um, intermediate junior league. And then for softball, we do triple A, little league division and senior league. Future Stars. Um, Future Stars is a tournament um, Ted came up with uh, several years ago um, to kind of replace that A team, B team thing we used to do, um, gives them a chance to have a little bit more postseason play, um, much like All-Stars. So these play under the special games, Regulation 9. Um, these continue to be, though, under the sole authority of California District 4 and Ted Boett. Um, therefore, the policies for future stars are also the District 4 policies. And we allow continued play for both 10U and 11U. Um, I believe those ages are eight to 10 and nine to 11, nine to 11. Um, Future Stars, unlike uh, TOC, though, is a double elimination tournament. Um, so it's, it's like an all-star tournament, just run solely by District 4. Um, however, Future Stars differs from TOC. Future Stars plays by the all-star rules. So they're going to be in the rule, tournament rules in the what used to be the back of your Little League rule book. Um, ground rules still apply. Again, that's uh, with regards to trees and um, uh, fencing and such like that. Uh, we'll go into time limits in that later. And then we have our All-Stars. The International All-Star Tournament is administered by, administered by the International Tournament Director at the Little League Baseball and Softball International Headquarters in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, or as Ted likes to call it, the Ivory Tower. Um, they are played under the regulation, playing rules and regulations, except for modified where it says tournament rules and guidelines. This is also a double elimination tournament. Um, depending on the division, these players will go on and play against in um, section, could go to state, west region, and then on to the Little League World Series, depending on the age bracket. For All-Stars, there are no local or interleague rules allow for All-Star tournaments. We play by the uh, Little League rules only. Um, ground rules, again, do apply, and they'll be reviewed at the tape plate meeting. There's a series of separate tournaments for both baseball and softball, um, the 8- to 10-year-old division, 9- to 11-year-old division. The Little League Baseball, that one we refer to as our 10 to 12 year old division, that's the one that would go on if they win throughout California, they go on to um, Williamsport, Pennsylvania for the Little League World Series. Um, other other uh, divisions like the 5070 division would play in Livermore Juniors, I forget where they play. And I don't know if the, um, there you go, not held this year, Senior League. Well, what does that mean? Well, originally we only had one team, so it wouldn't have been a district tournament, but now we have two teams, so it'll actually be a district tournament as well. Hey, there you go. All right. Um, also, let's see, uh, softball, we have the, the five divisions there, 8 to 10, 9 to 12. Little League softball, same, 10 to 12-year-old division, junior league and senior league. All right. Tournament game schedules and information. We're going to ask you guys to check this often, um, even several times a day, if necessary, as things change. But to find all the game schedules and information, you're going to go to the District 4 website, California Little League District 4.org. Um, you're going to click on that tournament link there at the bottom. That will bring you to our page of both tournament, cha tournament cha champions and all star tournament. From there, you're going to click on the year. Um, if you're interested, you can click on the previous years and get uh, the, the winners for each of those tournaments. But um, for this year, if you want to see the, the brackets, you're going to go right there, the 2023 for tournament champions or all-star. Um, 
Ted, future stars are under All-Stars, correct? That is correct. We made it onto the All-Star page last year to make it easy. Exactly. Okay. So to look for future star tournament brackets, you're going to look under the All-Star link there. All right. Once you click inside that link, you're going to get the tournament of champions and it's going to show you both the baseball and the softball side. You click on your particular bracket and it's going to show you the um, the sorry, the tournament schedule for that uh, for that division. For all stars. This one separated with future stars and all stars. You guys can see that the future stars are designated by that little F next to the 810 and 911 brackets. Again, check early, check often, check daily, check those schedules, check online. All right. And then, is that the same? Oh, we got a duplicate in there. Oh, that's pointing out, sorry, my apologies. That's pointing out the future star tournaments, the difference right there with the F and the FS. All right, once you click on those, if you guys haven't seen them already, this is what the brackets look like. It gives you the game number, the date, the time, and in between there and in between the, um, the brackets, it tells you the location. So in this case, you're seeing Martinez is the location, for no Hercules for the locations, and then each of the teams playing there. Um, the little numbers in the parentheses, those are the um, uh, umpire numbers. That's their that's their schedule. So they know what game they should be at. All right. I actually used this in, a, in an email today, Ted. You'd be very proud of me. Um, as a reminder, um, especially within District 4, but most especially when you're going out and re representing District 4 as a team, remember to win with dig dignity and lose with class. Um, it's our motto. It's actually a great motto for everybody to, to run their leagues by. So remind your teams um, often. All right. Here we go. You are the tournament director, and here's what you want to have prepared before the tournaments begin. There is a tournament director handbook um, that's going to be sent to those in attendance tonight and all the league presidents. Will it be available online as well? Yeah. Yes, it will be. Yes, it will be. Thank you. Um, tournament presentations will also be available online. We have lots coming up this weekend. So, or this week, sorry. So today is the first one. This is the T the tournament director. I believe tomorrow is TOC Wednesday, baseball All stars, Thursday, softball All stars or switch that. Tomorrow's TOC baseball or tomorrow. Yes. TOC baseball Wednesday is softball and Thursday, Thursday. All-Star Baseball. There you go. Um, the How to Construct an All-Star Binder, that's going to be updated. Um, there's actually some news that came down from the Ivory Tower to update those binders. Makes it a little bit easier for both you and us when it comes to re reviewing the binders as well as um, putting them together. All right. All forms that you need for those binders can be found on the, our uh, District 4 website under LL Forms. Once you click on that link there, the forms in green are required for TOC and future star binders. Forms in red are all required for all stars. Um, we're gonna go into those into mo more detail in a moment. All right. Create a tournament team. Um, hold on one sec. Hold on one sec, please. Sorry. <laughs> Did she come in? It's uh, Sarah. She's got a stuck kid. Uh, no, not right this second. Sorry. Um, my apologies. My neighbor's bringing me a kitten to save. Um, so as far as tournament teams go, uh, you can't do this alone. Um, I, I've been out there myself trying to be tournament director and the field guy and the uh, the person running the shack and the person doing the scorekeeping and everything else. So remember that you can't do this alone. Um, appoint a team, find a team, um, establish a host schedule. Um, for my league, we use both sign up genius or just a, a shared Google sheet where people can sign up. Um, we appoint leaders. 
um, running the snack shack. I've got a field guy that runs all the, the field setup and everything else. And he kind of recruits his crew. I've got my snack shack people that recruit their crews. And then all year long, I'm recruiting my um, uh, uh, scorekeepers and announcers. If you've got some great ones out there that have been working all season long, recruit them, get them in there and, and get them um, helping for postseason. They'll actually love it. Um, if you can, you can put hats or shirts to identify volunteers, you know, board member shirts, whatever it is, um, to make sure that they know who to go to. Oops, sorry. All right. All right. Your grounds crew, um, they're usually there earliest or um, at least at the same time you are. So we want to get the American and Little League flags hung up. Um, you're going to have the line chalker rakes, all the tools that you need to get those fields ready. Um, pitching mounds, pitching plates, mandatory breakaway bases. If you are hosting postseason games, your bases must be breakaway. Um, inside the score booth, you need an announcer, official scorekeeper, a pitch counter, um, and a spotter. Or pitch, count, pitch counter and spotter are typically the same. You want to have the national anthem or pledge of allegiance ready to go. Um, I think Jim and I did a game where uh, our sound system didn't work, and so we had everybody singing along. Um, that was a lot of fun too. Um, but I always say, get there early, check your sound system. Um, have rule books handy. I like having a hard copy rule book at, at every location. Um, we'll talk about having your, your stuff ready, but I have a bucket in each of my score booths that contain um, the rule books, lineup cards, um, all that stuff just at my fingertips. So if I need them, they're there. Um, always extra forms for teams, um, dress code. Somebody's going to forget it and we're going to make sure that it's in there. So there's no reason for that tournament not to continue on. Um, also at our fields, we keep the tournament brackets handy. Um, we do the paper rent print, the paper ones, but like I said, we check them often and then reprint is needed to make sure they're all out there. Um, as far as your ground rules go, very handy to have the written rules. So no matter who is a tournament director, um, it's, uh, it's the same every time those teams come to your field. Um, it's the same, uh, 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 gaps in the fence, trees, uh, gates, and so on. Um, much easier to just have that written out and ready for the plate meeting than it is to try and remember everything if, on the fly. Also my bucket, uh, I have my score books, my pens, pencils, erasers, uh, pitch counters, pitch count chart. Um, there's a new form this year, the TOC minimum play tracker chart, um, your lineup cards, envelopes for tie games, we'll go over all that. All right, for equipment, um, for TOC, um, and I assume for future stars that they'd be okay, we're gonna use the RS baseballs. Um, it's printed on there, it says RS. For um, all stars, they must be RST, T standing for tournament. Um, so make sure you have the, the right number of, the right type of baseball and the right, have a good supply of baseballs as well. Um, Little League approved, softball, uh, softballs for softball, um, the 11 inch softballs and the 12 inch softballs, same idea. Um, as a league, we always keep a couple extra helmets handy. Um, inevitably somebody's ripped, torn, cracked helmet will end up uh, in the lineup. And if you need extras, it's nice to have an extra one or two at the field for them just in case. Same goes for the dangling throat guards. We typically keep two in our bucket uh, just in case. All right, security. Um, it's it's definitely more important for um, these higher level of plays. The uh, I guess the more at stake, the the crazy your uh, parents get. So we want to make sure that we keep everybody calm. Um, so just having having somebody there walking the fields um, in in a shirt of some kind so that they know. Um, I typically let uh, Concord PD know that hey we're running this big tournament. Um, so they'll give us actually, they actually come and do a, do a drive by, but they actually come and watch games as well, which is a lot of fun to have a, a couple of uniform guys out there watching the game. Um, in that bucket, you also want to have local phone numbers, emergency, uh, hospitals nearby, um, make sure you have a first aid kit fully stocked and available in each of the score booths where you're hosting. 
All right, here we go. Um, I have a checklist and I believe, I don't think it's in the presentation, but it will be available online if you guys want a, a TD and announcer a scorekeeper checklist. We keep those handy in our booths so that they know exactly what they're doing. Um, if you have one, you're gonna put on that TD badge, wear it with pride, all right? You are the guy or the girl, you're the person keeping that tournament running. Um, you wanna make sure that all the people there that are showing up to that field um, know who to go to if they have questions. Um, make sure that all your volunteers are there and they know what their duties are. You're checking for your announcer, your scorekeeper, your pitch counter, um, the person uh, setting up the field and so on. First things first, make sure that American and Little League flags, make sure that those are raised and ready before the teams arrive. Um, as the TD, you're gonna walk the field, you're gonna make sure that everything's safe and ready to go. Um, have your trash cans, everything cleaned up and ready to go. All right, check that all important PA system. Um, those kids liked hearing their names announced. And uh, so you wanna make sure it's up and running. Um, I always make sure that uh, I, I have personally on my phone, the national anthem. If you wanna make Jeff Shee really happy, you put the USC marching band national anthem on your phone um, and play that one. It's actually nice and short too. Um, uh, do yourself a favor when picking a national anthem, pick one that doesn't go on for six or seven minutes. Those kids are out in the sun, they don't wanna hear it. Um, you're gonna put out your announcer checklist. Again, this is something we have on the D4 website. You can check, uh, download it. Um, it's a nice way for them to write the lineups, to get the pronunciation of the team names and stuff like that um, ready to go. Typically, I put three game balls on the backstop, and then I have extras in the booth ready to go for the umpires. Um, these are brand new balls, um, and then uh, you can keep the, the ones that get returned to your snacks or returned back to you, uh, foul balls in that. You can keep those handy to give back to the umpires. Again, making sure you have your first aid kit, emergency numbers. Um, and then if you can uh, set out a separate set of parking spaces for the umpires, um, somewhere close yet uh, somewhat secluded so they can get ready and um, kind of decompress and, and meet after the game without a lot of uh, foot traffic in that. All right. You want to verify that your field is lined correctly and ready to go. Foul lines run all the way to the home run pole, dead ball area marked. Pitcher circle, runner's lane, coach's box, et cetera. All right. Again, uh, typically for a, uh, for a TOC game, uh, you wanna be there at least 90 minutes early um, uh, for all stars and future stars. Uh, we're typically there two hours early. Um, teams will start arriving that early. So you wanna be ready to go. Um, make sure your pitching, pitching distances are correct. All right, when teams arrive. As the teams arrive to your field, first thing, greet yourself, inter or greet them, and then introduce yourself. Let them know who you are, your name, and that anything they need that they can direct those questions to you prior to the game start and then after the game is concluded. Um, make sure that they're at the right field. Doesn't happen often, but when it does, um, you don't want them lingering around there too long. You wanna know who's supposed to be there and um, what age group. Um, Teams are not allowed to enter the field until after the coin toss, until after home and visitors have been determined. Um, and we'll go over uh, that in just a sec, but just make sure that you're not letting those fields, on, those players onto the field to practice, to take up residence in any particular dugout and that until both managers have arrived and you've conducted the coin toss. Um, the way we do it here in district four is the team traveling the farthest gets to call the toss. Um, the winner of the toss gets to choose home or visitor. The loser of the toss gets to choose the dugout. There's no exceptions to this rule. Everybody's following the same one. So the team should be pretty much used to it by the time they get there. All right. Once you've determined, um, the manager's going to hand you the binders, and then you're going to tell them how the pregame ceremonies are going to go. They can each have their sides to warm up. Um, but typically 30 minutes before game time, um, that's reserved for all the um, pregame activities. So kids will be off the field, all warmups will cease. Um, before you let any of the managers or coaches on the field, you're going to check their identification against the roster or affidavit. Um, 
must be government issued, but um, we've been advising the managers for a long time to put their copies of their uh, photo IDs in their binders. That's acceptable. Um, it's actually preferable for us because I can just look at the binder one spot. I've got it. I've had to deny managers and coaches before because they've forgotten their wallets. So, all right. Um, the next thing you get to do is get to be fashion police. You get to check for compliance with the dress code. And this is important. This is, um, this is a, a tournament situation. You're representing your league. You're representing district four. So you should look professional. You look, should look like you should be out on the field. Um, we'll go over the dress code in, in more detail, but, um, it's strictly enforced. So, um, they're a little bit different for baseball and softball, but they have pertain to all levels of postseason play, TOC, future stars, and all stars. All right. All right. In your binders, the, the managers and coaches are signing this tournament um, dress code by the tournament dress code form. So they're aware of it. Um, so they should adhere to it. This is where you find it on the district four website website. Again, it's in the Little League Forms portion. Here's what your tournament dress code looks like. Liz, if I might. Yep. One of the new things this year is that doesn't have to be in the binder because that's also a test oh, that's right. by the president's letter. Okay. Uh, I would advise keeping a copy of your uh, dress code maybe in your bucket that's kept in the um, score booth so you can refer to it if you need it. All right, here is what is acceptable. Um, solid color doctor sty docker style pants or slacks, hem shorts, um, maximum two inches or above or below the knee. Um, managers and coaches, the shorts or slacks must be the same color. So you can have two guys in shorts and one guy in slacks, but they need to all be the same color. They should be wearing a collared shirt or team jersey tucked into their pants. And then coaches and manager shirts must match. Uh, team hat is required with the bill facing forward, closed toe shoes, and if not wearing the above, in intermediate and juniors, you're allowed to wear the full uniform. All right. For softball, solid color, same thing, solid color pants or slacks or shorts. Um, squirts can be worn for softball, and a same thing, have to be the same color um, slacks, shorts, or squirts. Uh, same color shirt, they have to match. Um, difference being for the hats, um, for softball, you can wear the visor with the bill forward, um, closed toed shoes. And again, for the uh, upper divisions, you can wear a full uniform if you choose to. Here's what's not acceptable. Um, and we've seen them all, sadly. Cutoffs, uh, cargo pants and shorts with the large baggy pockets. If they are the, the tailored ones, the nice ones with the nice flash pockets, those are fine. But we don't want the big bulky ones that looks like they're you know, carrying their camping equipment in them. Um, denim shorts are not allowed. Denim pants are not allowed. Um, hat to the side or backwards, not allowed. Um, and I really hope nobody's wearing sandals or open-toed shoes and metal cleats, but we've seen it. Here's a penalty for uh, violating the dress code. Um, the manager coach not to form, to conforming to the dress code will be confined to the dugout and not allowed in the field prior to and during the game. So if there are three that come up dressed, um, two are dressed appropriately, one is not. The one that is not will be in the dugout. They won't be able to come out. Even if it's the manager, they won't be able to come out, make changes. They won't be able to come out for the plate meeting and so on. Um, if nobody conforms to the dress code, the TD gets to appoint the one that's the most appropriate. Um, sorry, let's go back. If nobody conforms to dress code, then nobody gets to be base coaches. Those are going to be the kids. Um, if you've got to make a choice between three of them, you pick the one that's most appropriately dressed with the collared shirts and, and pants, and we'll designate that person as the, um, as the person allowed to make the changes and do the plate meeting. All right. After you've inspected their clothing, you're going to give them the four-part lineup card. Um, remind them not to separate. Uh, they often want to split them apart and, you know, give the scorekeeper theirs. Um, don't do that. They're going to keep it intact. You're going to give it to them, ask them to fill it out as, as soon as possible. Um, and then at, at a point, you're going to go collect it, bring it to the scorekeeper, and then bring it back to the managers. Um, once we've completed the identification, 
Only the manager, the two coaches, and the players are allowed on the dugout or on the field. No team parents, no safety parents, no extra coaches, no warm-up coaches, and so on. Um, only those three adults and the kids rostered on the team are allowed on the field after that. Um, I strongly advise keep your gates closed so it discourages other adults from entering the field. Um, this is what's changed a little bit, I believe. And Ted, maybe you can chime in here if we need it. Um, we're gonna, as the TD, you're gonna re review the team binder for required forms. And this has changed a little bit. Um, we're gonna talk about later what you're looking for. Um, you're gonna pull out that pitching record um, to get it ready to give to your um, scorekeeper and make a, make a note if there's any ineligible pitchers. I usually have a note card that I keep on me um, and I make a note of any ineligible pitchers. So then I'm, when I'm there for the plate meeting, I'm, I'm validating that the managers have mentioned everybody that's ineligible. Um, if it's first game of the tournament, just make sure the lead president has signed it. All right. Uh, this is a big one. This came up a couple days ago, actually. Do not share any team information with other teams or anyone. Uh, that means uh, if somebody comes to your scorebook, hey, can I see the ballot, you know, verification forms for, you know, Billy Smith? The answer is no. Um, what the, what's in those binders is for the manager's review as well as the TD. That's it. All right. Um, we're going to use the binder to verify all the players. What I do is I have them stand in line in the dugout um, up against the bench. And as I announce their name, I check for the Little League patch, and then I have them sit down. Um, this is a great way for your announcer to learn how to pronounce, pronounce the names. Or again, I've got my note card handy and I'm making notes at, um, if there's any um, unique pr uh, pronunciations. Um, by the time you get to the end of your affidavit or roster, everybody should be seating, sitting. Um, this only takes a minute or two. I typically conduct this while the, um, the other team is warming up um, but, uh, and the umpires are inspecting gear. Right. Um, team uniform, same, uh, same deal with the hat. All the kids must be wearing the same uniform. For baseball, hat must be well worn bill forward. For softball, hat or visor um, are optional. Um, little league patch must be adhered. It goes on the left shoulder, um, has to be attached. Uh, no safety pins, no um, tape, um, but it is required. Uh, eye black is allowed, but we're looking for just the single strip underneath. We're not doing the, the crosses or any of the other wacky things. Um, it'll, it'll be enforced. So that's, again, your job to make sure that they're adhering to it. Um, the coaches are all going to the all-star meeting and the TOC meeting, so they'll be informed of all of this, so they should be aware. Um, you're just double-checking that they're, they're listening to you. All right. Um, as far as if there are players without Little League patches. So if it's one to three players without a Little League patch, one adult base coach is eliminated. That means they stay in the dugout and you'll have a, a kid on the um, coaching one of the bases, kid in a helmet. Um, if there's four or more players, you lose both coach positions. All right. Here we go. <laughs> Take a breath, smile, the league is fun. It does sound like we're giving you a lot of um, uh, no's and uh, rules and regulations, but it is a ton of fun to be a TD. I, I sign up for a ton of them every year for postseason, so it's one of my favorite things to do. So make sure you enjoy it. Uh, make sure your snack shack's open and staffed. Um, that's important. Get those root beer floats going. Um, and make sure your announcers and scorekeepers are arriving. Um, Depending on the time of the game, because we start doing the announcements at um, 30 minutes before the game, always best to have your announcer and scorekeepers there at least 45 minutes, but preferably an hour before the game starts. All right, continued on. Um, greet the umpires. Um, they're instructed to come to you and find them, but um, I always like going to find the guys. They're, they're, they're um, a lot of fun to chat with, so I usually get stuck with them for a little while. But um, introduce yourself. Do the same thing, have your note card handy and get the pronunciation of their names, what positions they're, um, they're umpiring for the evening so that when you make their announcements, um, you're also doing theirs correctly. 
Um, re remember that if there are youth umpires, there must be a game coordinator. Game coordinator does not need to be on the field, but they need to be at the field. Um, if there's no game coordinator, we cannot proceed without them. Um, if for whatever reason, there's no umpires, always check the parking lot. They've got a lot of prep to do before the game starts. Um, if you don't find them out there, then give Don a call. All right, um, when you're meeting with the umpires, just let them know if there's any dress code or patch violations so they're aware why there's no coaches on the field for whatever reason. Um, and there you go, get the names and pronunciation. All right, pregame and warm up ceremonies. You guys are doing great, hang in there. All right, prior to any infield outfield practice, have both teams put their equipment outside the dugout for umpire inspection. Um, all gear. So if it's a backup bat, if it's a backup helmet, if it's a backup catcher gear, it all has to be out there. If it's in the dugout, then it has to be inspected by the umpires prior to the game. Um, any illegal or damaged equipment will be given to you, and you're going to place that in the score booth, and you're going to return it to the team later with a reminder to them to not bring it to the next game unless it's been repaired. Um, if it's an illegal bat, uh, tell them to keep it at home. You don't want it there. 30 minutes before game time. This is when we start to do the announcements. And uh, if you've got some really good announcers, get them in there because it's a lot of fun. You're gonna start with announcing the home team. Um, the home team has field for practice uh, at the start of the 30 minutes prior. They get the, uh, the field for 10 minutes and whether they take the field or not, um, that 10 minutes belongs to them so that the visiting team doesn't get to start, doesn't get to start early. While they are doing their infield, the visiting team is inside the dugout. They're not using the, the out of uh, the foul territory or anything else. They are in the dugout. And again, that's usually when I'm conducting my, my patch and um, player verification. 20 minutes before game time, we're going to announce, announce the visiting team. Visiting team has filled for practice. That visiting team has filled for practice for 10 minutes. And then the home team is in the dugout. All right. Um, prior to the game, this is still prior to the game, you're going to help the umpires monitor for safety, just making sure everything's good to go, that only the manager and two coaches on the field. Um, when players are in the dugout, an adult must be in the dugout. Um, now, um, this is new. Adults may warm up pitchers only in TOC and future stars. During the regular season, adults were allowed to warm up pitchers. So it's going to be a little, a little bit of a learning curve for all stars. During All-Stars, the adults are not warming up pitchers. So it might be a good remain, reminder to the um, manager and coaches prior to the game start for, for All-Stars that they're not allowed to warm up their pitchers. All right. Oops. Oh, there we go. Um, adults may bat and catch. They can hit the hit infield um, for TOC. They may be... They, they, they may bat, but not catch for all stars and future stars. Any player holding a bat or near a bat must have a helmet on. So if they're out in the field, they're doing their warm ups, they're swinging bats, they've got to have a helmet on. All right. Catchers warming up a pitcher, pitcher must have a catcher's helmet with a dangling throw card. Does not need to, does not apply to the coaches. Um, catchers involved in infield and outfield near a bat must also wear a catcher's helmet and dangling throat card. Pre-game ceremonies. 10 minutes before game times, we're going to begin the pre-game ceremony. Um, each site determines their own ceremonies. At minimum, you're going to do the Little League pledge, um, announce the volunteer Little League umpires, um, Introduce the teams, team members, managers, and coaches by name. Again, learn those pronunciations beforehand. Um, introduce the umpires by name. Note that they are volunteers from California District 4 Umpire Association. Play your national anthem or recite the Pledge of Allegiance. And then read the, uh, the, the Little League Pledge. So the Little League Pledge is, pledge is on the back of your rule book. Um, not required, but this is one way to line up the players. You have the TD in the middle. They're going to line up between first and third, one team on one side. The umpires are going to be behind home plate. All right. 
Up until the plate meeting, the TD is in charge. Once the home team hands a lineup card to the umpire, the umpires take charge of the field. Um, only managers and team captains are allowed at the plate meeting. Um, TD should be at the plate meeting, goes over the written ground rules, um, yeah, especially if the umpires are not from that field. Right. Um, there's one more thing there. Okay. I don't know if we've been filling, fielding any questions, but if there are any questions, now would be the great time to ask. Okay, uh, Liz, we have a few questions. Um, first, we start off with a few comments. Uh, Ron wanted to emphasize two points and to have them emphasized at the coaches' meetings that the coin toss is first. Um, that would be before anybody gets on the field. Absolutely. Also emphasize that uh, coolers and fast food are not allowed except for players cooler in dugout. Correct. Um, so someone asks, team t-shirts that are matching are okay for TOC, correct? That's going to be Ted, but we are actually asking him to all have collared shirts, right? Matching t-shirts for TOC would be okay. Uniform style tops for all-stars would be okay. Okay. Um, Arnold mentions, if not covered in presentation, review what jewelry is uh, permitted. Oh, okay, so for baseball, um, no jewelry is permitted. Um, I believe, unless it's a life alert bracelet. Um, for softball, the only change that I'm aware of, it's also no jewelry, but I think the beads in the hair are allowed. Is that correct, Jim? That is correct. Hard beads that control hair are allowed in softball and baseball. And baseball. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Right. Um, can you please address the standards requiring announcing full names and providing full names on lineup cards? Oh, absolutely. So when the managers are filling out, and we'll, we'll go over this in the manager meeting as well, the managers have to fill out full first and last names on the lineup cards. Um, first initial or just putting Billy or Tommy, um, not, not acceptable. It has to be first and last. It has to match the, um, I take that back, it doesn't exactly have to match the, the tournament affidavit. Um, when we go to make the announcements, if a child's name is Thomas Rose, for example, um, but he goes by Tommy. You can announce Tommy Rose. Um, that's one of the reasons, like I said, you have that note card um, ready to go so that if there's any of those corrections for the announcements, um, they're there. But we are announcing first and last name when players come up to bat. Same with the coaches, first and last names. Okay. Uh, so the plate meeting is after the national anthem and Little League pledge. Correct. It's the last thing we do before um, the game uh, begins. So um, we do the plate meeting. Uh, and this is important that the teams are still in their dugouts um, while the plate meeting is going on. We don't want balls being thrown around while the umpires are talking to the managers. And then we'll let them do their um, warm ups after. Okay. What's the reasoning? Let me admit somebody. Um, what's the reasoning regarding being allowed to be able not to catch for all stars? Uh, that's part of the little league rule. That's how they made it. That's how it was approved this year, that it was approved for allowing adults to catch during, um, TOC and regular season, but not all stars. Um, I think one of the, part of the reasoning was that once a player, they, they wanted to allow adults to catch the players because it speeds up the warm up or it speeds up the, the game a little bit. Um, in all stars at that point, and with that level of play, the player should be able to catch quickly and speed up that that game themselves. Okay. For other tournament directors who are not able to attend today, are there other requirements besides watching this presentation? Uh, no, no other requirements. Um, if anybody's interested, um, I'm happy to have them come shadow me for a game or three or five, however many they want to do. I, I do lots of postseason games. I'm happy to let them come to my field and or to Martinez or wherever else I'm a TD for the day um, to kind of get a little hands-on experience. Okay. Uh, and a final comment. Uh, 
the scorekeeper needs the lineups early and can return or take pictures. Coaches should expect this always. Correct. So what I what I typically do is I give the lineup card to the managers and coaches. I ask them to fill that out as soon as possible. And then I will go collect it from them at least 45 minutes before the game. Um, hopefully they've got them. A lot of them have them pretty much ready to go and are just filling out the names um, quickly. And then I give it to my scorekeeper and the announcers. They write down everything that they need to do or take a picture and they can write it down from there. And then prior to the plate meeting, prior to the warmups, and when I'm checking the players, I'm returning those lineup cars to the managers. Okay, Liz, that's all our questions for this part of the presentation. Awesome. All right. So that was all preliminary. And I know it's a lot of stuff. Um, that's the biggest part of it is, is making sure you've got everything dialed in before the game. And now we're going to go on to during the game, game responsibilities. Um, um, if you've got well-behaved fans, this is the, the easier part. Um, but you are monitoring spectators. Make sure they abide by field rules as well as parent code of conduct. Um, remind the spectators of the Little League District and League rules regarding no outside food. So that's where the ice chest comes into play. Um, these leagues that are hosting, and I'm preaching to the choir if you guys are here at the meeting, but we'll tell it to the, to the coaches and managers as well. Um, these leagues that are hosting the meeting are not getting any compensation for, um, for doing so. They're doing it, you know, with their volunteers. And um, so one of the ways that we can support them is um, using their snack shack or concession stands and such, et cetera, to, to do that. So um, remind your leagues, remind your managers not to bring outside food. Al there's no alcohol, no smoking, no dogs, and no noisemakers. And yes, saxophones count as no noisemakers. It's happened. All right. Keep your umpires happy. Um, my favorite thing is to keep them hydrated. Um, I, I don't like collapsing umpires at our field. It's happened. Um, so make sure that you've got plenty of water available. Um, I also keep a Gatorade or two just in case to make sure everybody, and I'm reminding them multiple times of the game, let me get you some more water, whatever you need. Um, uh, just so you're aware, the tournament director, not the managers, not the umpires or anybody else, you guys are responsible for the fans. So everything outside the fence is your responsibility. The managers and um, umpires have everything inside the fence. Right. However, if there are behaviors that need to be addressed, if the umpire says, hey, um, this person in the stands is, is out of line, um, then it's your responsibility to go talk to them and address it. Um, if there's something happening on the inside of the, the, the field and they need you to address it, you can also do the same. Um, keep the fourth coaches away from the dugouts. This is big rule. Um, there is no, um, uh, this is my personal scorekeeper. So the, you cannot have a scorekeeper sitting right next to the fence, feeding the, the manager or coaches information from outside the field. It's not allowed. Um, we kind of call it the, uh, the glass wall. Um, everything inside the field happens inside the field. Uh, this is probably the thing you run into the most. Um, so make sure that we're keeping those things away, um, that they're not getting their pitch counts from their personal uh, scorekeepers, but they're getting the pitch counts, which will be announced during the game um, from the official scorekeeper. Um, let's see. Uh, I don't know that it's on here. I, I be don't believe it is, but I'm just going to mention it, that if for any reason a player, coach, or manager needs to leave the dugout to run to the restroom, whatever it is, they need, to, they need to check in with the umpire prior to doing that. Um, and then you're going to keep an eye on that, make sure that they're leaving um, and using the restroom only and coming back. There's no running to the snack shack or running to their cars or whatever it is. Um, make sure that you are immediately available to the umpires at all times so that you can handle any protests or escalation, escalations. All right. Hopefully you do not have to deal with this, but we're going to go over it anyway. Ejections. Um, if a manager or coach is ejected, they must leave sight and sound. That means they can't sit in their car in the parking lot. They have to go. Um, they are permanently removed from the team. Uh, a second ejection um, in any D4 special game, they cannot participate again in any future D4 special game. So if you are ejected and you are ejected for a second, second time, you will not be approved as a manager to come back and, and host or uh, participate in a postseason game. 
Um, your local league um, may impose additional penalties. I know mine will. Um, so uh, just keep that in mind. All right, we said that uh, manager and coach must leave sight and sound. Minimum penalty, um, you are suspended for that, that one game. So the game that you leave is not your one game suspension. It's the game that you leave and one more. So you are not allowed to be there for um, the following game. Um, uh, this includes any pre or post game uh, activities with the, with the team. So you can't be there to warm them up and then leave. You can't be there as a fan. You're just not allowed to be there. Um, if you are ejected for a mandatory play requirement, it is permanent removal from the tournament and no replacement manager is allowed. And again, the local league can impose additional penalties if they decide. All right, for player ejections, player ejections are a little bit different. Um, players can remain in the dugout. Um, if they're not gonna stay in the dugout, they can be released to a parent and remain in the stands or they can be released, released to the TD. Um, if you think that that player is going to be disruptive in the dugout, um, then release them to us and we'll be the babysitters for the rest of the uh, tournament or the rest of the, the game. Penalty is the same. It's that game and one more. Um, and that, again, includes any pre post game meetings with the team. All right. Again, hoping we don't have to deal with this, but in the case of protests or forfeits. All right. Protest procedures differ between TOC and Future Stars um, and All Stars. Forfeits can only be declared in TOC and Future Stars by Ted Boet and in All Stars by the Tournament Committee in Williamsport. All right. Probably one of the first places where we're seeing a big difference between Future Stars, TOC, and All Stars. For TOC and Future Stars, um, because they are run by District 4 alone, um, they have different uh, protest uh, procedures. Here's what can be protested. Awarding of bases, rules interpretation, minimum play uh, requirement violation, and in an ineligible pitcher or player. What cannot be protested are umpire's judgment, equipment, ejections, protests, and any protests that occur after the next pitcher or play. Um, of course, as a manager, they can try and protest anything and we'll deal with it accordingly that that's what's gonna be awarded or not awarded. All right. Uh, any protests must be made in accordance with rule 4.19. They have to be made before the, the next pitch play or attempted play. And in this case, play stops until the protest is resolved. There's no playing under protest. We don't continue, we make a decision and then we move on. Um, what's gonna happen is all the umpires are gonna confer, they're gonna make a ruling. If the manager does not agree with that ruling, they may continue the protest. Um, the umpire chief is going to report that to you as the TD, and the TD will make their decision. The TD can use a protest committee. Um, protest committee could be Ted or another District 4 member, um, could be other board members from your league, provided your team's not playing. Um, I would not suggest a protest committee that includes um, family members from the teams uh, there to watch the game. The TD's decision is final and no and other appeals may be made. <clears throat> so that means that once uh, you as a TD has made a determination that you're going to allow it or not allow it based on the information you re receive from the umpires and the managers, that's it. As a TD, you're going to write up and report that protest to DA Ted Boet after the game. All right. Uh, grounds for forfeit and TOC and future stars, <clears throat> violation of any of the following, minimum play requirement after a completed game, um, illegal substitutions, pitch count uh, violations, ineligible pitchers, an ineligible, illegal player. Um, forfeits, umpires, TDs may not forfeit games. Only Ted can do that. That's for a future stars or TOC game. Protest for all stars. Same protestable situation, the warning of bases, rules, interpretation, minimum play, ineligible, ineligible pitcher or player. What's not protestable, umpire judgment, equipment, and so on. However, um, all-star still has to be made in, before the next pitch, play, or attempt in play, and all-stop plays during the protest. Um, games cannot be played. 
Um, even if the protest is over an umpire's judgment, the protest must be allowed to continue. The URC or TD does not decide what is or is not protestable. So as I said, you can protest anything you want, um, but those are what's gonna be uh, enforced, let's see. When a formal verbal protest is made by a manager to the USC, the umpires will confer. If unresolved, the USC cons consults with the TD. Um, as a TD, you're contact contacting Ted Goet yourself. Um, if Ted can't be contacted, then we'll move on to the next level. Um, he's very available during postseason, so that's not usually an issue. Um, if the manager doesn't agree, if it can't be resolved in the, with the TD or the DA, then we're going to call West. Western Regional Headquarters. If unresolved after Western Regional Headquarters decides, then it goes to the Tournament Committee in Williamsport for a final decision. For All-Stars, there is no local protest committee. The TD does not make any rule, ruling. Um, and here's the most important one. The managers are not calling Williamsport. The managers are not calling Ted. All phone calls are handled by the DA or the TD only. All right, if a protest is made, you're gonna fill out the tournament protest form that Ted's gonna email you. And that way we have a better record for re relaying all the information over the phone. All right. If you guys have a camera, take a picture of this page, make sure you have Ted's phone number. All right, the phone numbers for West Region headquarters are gonna be found in the tournament director's handbook. International headquarters also, um, if there's any calls to be made to international headquarters, Western region is gonna make that phone call. Bottom line, don't distribute this phone number and do not allow use for any other purposes besides this protest. All right, getting there. Ending of the game for tournament of champions. Run rules are in effect, 15 runs after three, 10 after four, eight after five. Um, baseball 50, 70 juniors, it's just one more inning um, for those same uh, run rules. Right. There are no time limits, um, no time limits in TOC. A game is called, if a game is called by darkness or weather, it's the umpire and it's, inter, uh, sorry, terminated immediately. It's the umpire's call. Um, if your league has a red light, if your league uses um, a local rule saying, you know, 15 minutes after sunset, whatever that is, those are not in play. Um, it is the umpire's call to decide whether a game is too dark or the weather is not playable. All right. If a game ends in an incomplete inning, if, if a regulation game is ended in an incomplete inning, the score will revert back to the last completed inning, provided the visiting team scores one or more runs. Um, to tie or go ahead, and the home team does not tie the score or take the lead during an incomplete inning. All right. If there's a tie game, tie games continue to there's a winner. Um, if stopped at a tie, then the game will be completed at a later date. Tie games are rescheduled for a 4 p.m. start on weekdays prior to the next scheduled game or one hour before the start of a, of a weekend game. Um, the day of the next scheduled game. Any, any tie games, you're going to report tie games as soon as possible to Ted Boet. And then in a sealed envelope, you're going to send the official score sheets, the UIC's official line of cards, and either team manager and, and give with the team manager to the next location to, the complete, to complete the tie game. All right. All stars and future stars, a little bit different. Um, game ends when 15 runs after three, 10 after four. Uh, game ends for intermediate and juniors, one extra inning, like I said, 15 after four, 10 after five. Again, no time limits and no eight run rule for all stars and future stars. And that's a big difference there. All right. Regulate regulations called games called for for darkness, whether a curfew are completed if a winner can be determined. Any game which a winner cannot be determined shall be resumed at the point of suspension. Um, this includes incomplete, not regulation and tie games. If in a regulation game, the visiting team ties or takes the lead in the top half of the inning and the home team cannot complete its half of the inning or take the lead, the game is suspended and resumed at the point of suspension. 
um, these do not revert back into the to the previous inning. All right. Uh, if a game is tied at the start of the eighth inning in Little League or the ninth inning in intermediate juniors and seniors and any subsequent innings, the batter scheduled to bat last, that inning will be placed on second base to, at the start of the inning. Um, eligible substitutes and special pit runners are allowed for seniors. Um, suspended games, reporting and rec recording. Report tied and suspended games as soon as possible to Ted. And the same thing in the sealed envelopes and the official score sheets, the umpire's lineup cards and either team manager with, with either team manager to the next uh, completed to their, oh, sorry, to the next location to complete the tie game. All right. After the final outs, you're gonna announce the winning team's next game. And then for all stars and future stars, since they have a double elimination, you're also going to announce the losing team's next game if it's the first loss. Make sure to give the date, time, game site, and opponent. If you've got a smartphone, check the website. Make sure you're giving them the correct information. All right. After the final out, you're going to return the binders to the managers after you've completed and signed the uh, pitching, after your scorekeeper completes the pitching affidavit and you sign it. Um, you're going to return those binders to the manager. Um, you're going to re return any uh, equipment that was removed to the managers. Again, remind them not to bring it again next time. And if the team is continuing on, make sure, again, tell the manager when and where he plays again. All right. For TOC and future stars, again, complete the pitching, uh, pitching record in ink, sign the pitching record. Oh, we do that. I went ahead of myself. Um, again, make sure you're signing that in ink as the TD. Um, all pitching affidavits need to be completed in ink, not pencil. So if you have to go back over it in ink, that's fine. Um, and make sure you fill out any objections under replacements in All Stars. There is, um, as part of the um, tournament affidavit, there is a, a place where you can fill out objections or replacements. All right. After the game. Um, immediate reports of scores. You're going to text um, Ted the scores. Assume you're the only one reporting this information. Um, I, we'd rather get it five times than not at all and not have to chase you down later. You're going to report the division, the level, the league or team, innings and score. Um, any exceptional information. So report any ejections, protests or replacements. Um, if you had a particular fan that was unruly that had to be ejected from the field, any of that stuff. Give him that little bit of extra detail so he knows what happened out the field. Um, after the game, escort the umpires from the game. Make sure that they're not getting a question on the way back out. Um, provide them light refreshments or a meal from your snack shack. Um, keep track of the fan behavior, note it, and then assist anybody else that needs it. All right. Ensure your field is dragged, bases are put away clean up around the field at the trash and so on. There you go, stop and smile. Um, thank your volunteers. Thank coaches and managers for doing a good job. Thank the fans for doing a good job. Um, they might just put you on their website apparently and uh, be prepared to do it again all over the next day. All right, after the final out of a championship game, um, local leagues get to award participation pins to their participants. Um, so the leagues are given their own pins. This is not something that's handed out by the TD. Um, you're going to give the awards to both teams, uh, banner awarded to the winning team. And then you're going to take a photo and you're also going to text that to Ted as soon as possible. Um, for future stars, for future stars, sorry, there's a banner also awarded to the championship team. And for all stars, the host league um, awards championship pennant, local league award participation pins to their participants and then take winning photo. Um, we have rings for TOC, correct, Ted? Okay, so for, a, for the TOC um, uh, winners, um, the leagues hosting the championship games will have the, um, the rings, the um, championship rings to give to the players at the presentation. All right, ready for some more questions if there are any.
You're muted, Jim. Of course we have questions. <laughs> um, who carries signed code of conduct forms? Will president certify this too? Side so the code of conduct. So um, you're going to see later in the presentation um, the document, but the code of conduct for the players should be in the binders. Um, every player's parents are required to sign a code of conduct. And then Ted made a, um, like a combination, a form much like we used to do with the concussion form, um, where it's a single page where all the all the parents sign um, on a single page instead of 12 to 14 separate documents. Okay. As an umpire, what do I do if something comes up that requires the TD, but the TD is at another field at the complex? Hopefully you have one TD per game. That's the, that's the recommendation. Um, but if you've got an announcer, um, the announcer can make a, an announcement to get that tournament director back to the field. Um, or you can also use um, a uh, handheld walkie-talkie situation just to keep the TD um, available. But they should be at the field the whole time. Okay. Uh, Rick e emphasized, especially for pregame announcements, that a team's game changer, a team's game changer, is not the scorebook of record. The scorebook of record is the only one that matters. Absolutely. Um, can an official scorekeeper use Game Changer in lieu of a paper book? Not at this time, no. It's going to be a paper book um, because that way it can be continued on at the next field should there be a tie or a continuation game. Okay. Um, and this is just a comment because this came in after we made the uh, deck. Uh, the Western Region phone number will not be in the TD handbook. The number will be sent by Ted to the league. Okay. Um, is there a checklist for all these items? There is. I've created a TD checklist, and then there's an announcer and scorekeeper checklist as well. And it, it actually reads as a checklist. It's got little boxes, so you can go down um, in the correct timeline and check everything off. Okay. Uh, does or can fan bad behavior have implications on the field? Um, well, if, if the fan behavior is, is poor enough, um, the umpires and I will get together, we'll put all the teams in their dugout, and until that fan is removed, the game's not going to proceed. Okay. Are games allowed to be streamed? Um, you know, that was a question that came up during West Regionals. Um, the way it's supposed to work is that um, the person who is streaming it has to get permission from both teams to allow it. So I would say if that's the case, check in with the TD and the TD can verify that that the managers and the, and the, and the players have authorized it. Okay, Liz, those are all our questions for this uh, section. Awesome. All right. Here we go. Future stars and all-star binders. All right. So the manager is required to bring those binders to each game. Um, without certain forms, they're not going to be able to enter the field or play. Um, when the teams arrive, the tournament director will take possession of the binder and hold it into the score booth or after, after the game. Um, again, pitching records are going to be filled out in ink and signed or initialed by you um, before handing it back to the manager. Um, I'm sure it's in here, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, it's just a reminder that those binders are for your eyes only. Um, if we need to know how old a player is to um, check their pitching app, uh, pitching out, uh, uh, sorry, pitching limit, um, then you can look up the look up the player's information and their birth date, et cetera, to find that information. But it is not um, to be shared with other other managers, other coaches, or most certainly not other fans um, coming into their score booth. All right. TOC and Future Star binders must contain the following. Um, the team roster, that's available at the District 4 website. It's going to have the manager and coach names and be signed by the local league president. Um, the pitching record has to be filled out and signed and initialed after each game. The president's affirmation page, that's going to be signed by the league president. We'll go over what that is in a few. Um, the president's affirmation for medical releases. 
also signed by the lead president. And then that parent code of conduct that we just discussed a few minutes ago, also signed by the parent guardian for every player. All right, this is a little different. Um, this year, medical releases are not required, but we are highly, highly, highly recommending it um, to have that information in the case of emergency, something that can go along with the paramedics if needed. Um, the thing that's optional is a photocopy of the ID for the manager and coaches. Um, you can have this or um, they have to show it as they enter the field from, from their own pockets. The team roster is required in the binder. No team roster, you can't play. Um, has to be signed by the manager. Um, this verifies the players, um, list the managers and two coaches that are board approved. And there's no substitutes, players, coaches, or managers for TOC. Right. Softball team uh, roster, when teams arrive at the field, maps the rostered adults with the government issued photo. Um, no temporary or, or extra coaches. Um, and then again, just like you would do for all stars, even for TOC and future stars, have them all stand up, say each player's name and have them sit to make sure the players in the dugout are who they say they are. All right. Um, again, verify with the government ID to make sure that they're there matching at the bottom there. Picture record required, uh, pitching record is required in the binder, must be brought to each game. It's signed by the TD and, and initialed by the manager. Um, this records all the total pitches, the threshold, the days of rest, and when they're next eligible to pitch. Um, for softball, it, the form records each pitcher's innings pitched. All right. At the end of each game, this board must be filled out in pen and signed by tournament director and initialed by the manager before being returned to the team. Right. Um, for baseball, make sure you're filling out all the categories. Um, threshold, re, re, uh, sorry, threshold observed, when's the next playing, and so on. Um, make sure that the managers are initialing these. Um, once their initials are given back to the and given back to the managers, there's no changes made. We can't go back the next day and say, "Oh, I really meant to put 55." All right. All right, this is what's different. So now this year we have the president's affirmation page. It's gonna be signed by the league president and required in the binder. Um, what this is affirming, so we don't have 500 pages of stuff in the binders is the four required training for managers and coaches have been completed. That is the concussion, the SCA, the abuse awareness, and then the diamond leader training. Uh, the manager is going to sign this document um, stating that the manager and coaches in that dugout have completed all four of those online trainings. Um, also sign that they're, um, they have completed and are aware of the youth sports concussion protocols for California, um, that all parents have been provided and signed the heads up concussion information sheet and that they've been forwarded about the dress code. So this one document is gonna take care of all that paperwork. The next one, as far as medical releases go, we're asking for the same thing. The manager, the, sorry, the president is going to confirm that the manager and coaches have been instructed. We, we want best practice, get those medical releases in there for all the players. But what is allowed is that the presidents can provide this document saying that all their players have um, completed and have a medical release on file. All right, still required in the binder, um, the parent code of conduct. Um, each player must have a parent or guardian signed code of conduct form in the binder. Um, I believe the one I have on the District 4 website is a two-sided document. It has a medical release on the front and the parent code of conduct on the back. But um, Ted created a uh, the one-pager or technically a two-pager where it is a, um... oh, that's the one-pager, Ted? Sorry, um, I'll put the other it, one up. There. So that's that's the single use one. So if yeah. every kid wants to do one individually, that's it. Right. 
So this is a single use one, but there's another one that looks much like the um, concussion form where it has all this information. And then the back page is a spot for 15 signatures for the parents or guardians of those players to sign one single page that they've received and acknowledge this information. Again, the president's affirmation page for medical release attests that the medical release forms for each player at each game is, um, again, having them there is best practice. Um, make sure that the it's a wet signature on that, not a photocopy. That's what we mean by blue ink. All right. POC and future stars. Make sure we have the team roster, the pitching record, President affirmation page, president's affirmation, medical release, and parent code of conduct. Again, highly recommended but not required medical releases. And then optional but not required is a photocopy of the three uh, manager and two coaches um, identifications. All right. All-star binders. Um, this one's a little bit more uh, involved, but it's actually getting a little bit easier. Um, the eight-page all-star affidavit and boundary map with included signatures. This is um, created in the data center um, by um, a board member or somebody that's got access to the data center. Um, and then when you print it out, it's going to have the map included and all that. Um, we don't typically fill these out by hand anymore. Um, for each player, there's going to be three or more documents confirming the parent's residency or uh, best practice, get the school enrollment form um, appropriately signed by each player. Um, verification of the valid birth certificate. A birth certificate copy is not required in the binder. So what's going to happen is leagues are going to bring their all-star binders to um, the verification day. As a district, we're going to verify those binders. And then um, we're going to, uh, you can take the, original birth certificates and copies back out of those binders. Um, that's just for a um, identity protection. All-star binders are required to have the president's all fact affirmation page, again, the medical release affirmation page and the parent code of conduct. And again, like the other binders, um, highly recommended to have the uh, medical release form and recommended but optional to have the photocopies of the managers and coaches. All right. The affidavit boundary map is required in the binder. Again, it's gonna print out when you print out that affidavit, um, it's automatically generated and it will show us who's not in district, or sorry, who's not in your boundaries. Um, this is also gonna be uh, signed by the league president. So the league president is authorizing that all those players live in your boundaries or go to school in your boundaries. Um, again, the all-star affidavit, um, it's eight pager. The last two pages are just pitching ref record. Um, it has all the league information, the players. Um, this is where if you need to check a, um, a player's age, his birth date for pitching information, um, this is where you would check to get that official birth date. Ooh, those are tiny. As a TD, here's what you're looking for. You're looking to see that it has been signed by the league president, um, the manager, and the district administrator has approved it. Um, if there's not a signature by the district administrator and hasn't been signed, um, it's not been a verified binder. All right. When you're matching those government IDs for all stars, these are where you're going to find the managers and coaches, the official. You circle the right spot. There we go. That's your official managers and coaches are the names that you're looking for. When you're checking your player names, we're checking our player name here, the birth date, it's usually right, oh, there we go. League age is right there. So you're gonna be checking for the league age. Um, that's gonna help you with pitching requirements or pitching limits. All right. At the end of the game, again, it's filled out with pens, signed by the TD and initialed by the manager. Make sure you're filling in every little piece there. Um, when it says here, uh, level of play, um, that's your all-stars, your age group, et cetera. There you go. Right. 
Uh, again, make sure they're completed prior to the end, uh, sorry, before you give them the binders back and that the managers have initialed them. Again, nothing's going to be changed after they leave the field. Oop, that's a duplicate, isn't it? Yep. Huh. I think we had some duplicates in there, Jim. That might be me when I copied them over. All right. Um, again, the uh, verification of age will be the affidavit signed by District 4. We're not going to keep a copy of the birth, birth, certificate, birth certificates in the binders. Um, if you're helping your league or if you can remind your presidents, make sure that those originals most definitely are not in the binders when they're, when they're handed in during games. All right. Um, this is the other thing you're looking for. This is the... Um, the player affidavit. This is also going to be signed by the president. It's also signed and stamped by the district that has been verified. Um, if it's not stamped, it's not been verified. The districts, it's not eligible. All right. All right. Uh, to be eligible for all stars, you have to be um, either live or attend school in the boundaries of your league. Um, the school enrollment form is much easier to provide. Um, but I would highly recommend that the parents get it signed by the school and not a school represent or not a league representative. It's actually um, not legal for you to um, go and get information from the school on behalf of somebody else's child. Um, if you need to, the residency is proved by the three documents from three different little league categories. Um, there is a um, residency requirement document we'll, we'll show you here in a second. Um, all of these proofs of residency are going to be stamped by the district. Again, you'll see the, the district four circular stamp that says that we've um, received and approved these, this, these uh, documents. This information is also allowed uh, online as far as age and residency requirements. So you'll have all the information that you need. There's your school enrollment form. Again, Medical release, not required, but highly recommended. All right, just going over, I know it's a lot of information. You guys are hanging in there, so thank you very much. Um, in the, the All-Star binders, we need the eight page All-Star affidavit with the boundary map, all created by um, the data center when you put your information in there for all your players. Um, for each player, you're going to have three or more documents confirming the parent's residency or the school enrollment form, um, the term of verification form for each player, and um, again, the verification of valid birth certificate. We're not keeping those in the binder. Um, for for uh, binder verification, the birth certificate needs to be in there. For gameplay as a TD, you're not looking for the birth certificate. Um, also included the president, again, the affirmation page, medical release, and parent code of conduct. And we beat that one up a few times, but we're going to say highly recommended, not required. Um, all right. Replacing a manager, coach, or player in All-Stars. For in All-Stars, temporary replacement of coach or manager, there's a permanent replacement or a permanent replacement of a player. For a temporary replacement, it's, it's done by the TD. It's a one-day replacement, so no background check is required, and you need an approval letter from the league president. That letter has to accompany that manager or coach um, temporary replacement um, to the field. Um, you're going to enter the temporary replacement name and date and sign in the space below the permanent replacement um, section. Let me show you where that's at. So you're going to sign it down below not in the permanent one. That is a one day replacement. Um, Ted, correct me if I'm wrong. The same person cannot replace a manager or coach twice because that's no longer a one-time replacement. Well, yes, you can do it more than once. Temporary is temporary. You can be temporary more than once. Okay. okay. 
All right. Permanent replacement of a manager coach. You need, again, an authorization, authorization letter signed by the um, league president. In this case, it's different, though. With the heavy line, you're going to cross out the manager for coach replace it. So you're just striking out one solid line. Um, don't use white, ain't, white out. Don't use pencil. We still need to be able to see the name. And then you're going to enter in the replacement name and signature there at the bottom. You go. If it's a permanent replacement of a manager or coach, the TD is going to place a new manager name in the information in the replacement section. There you go. This is permanent replacing a manager. All right. Permanent replacement player replacement. We need 24 hour notice to the district. Um, either Ted or one of the, uh, our ADAs will um, review all the supporting documents before the next game. The TD, DA, or ADA will strike through the names in ink to remain re readable with no whiteout. And if we add a player to the affidavit, step-by-step -step instructions are available in the handbook. Um, we have the documentation, everything else. We typically will have um, one of our district staff attend the next game to validate that player's information prior to letting him play in the game. All right. Um, use the 2023 tournament director's handbook for guidance. It gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to replace it. Go. Again, um, all, uh, all the proof of age requirement, residence, tournament player verification, school enrollment form, all that stuff is available on the D4 website. Um, this is not a required document, but it is nice for handing to a, a manager or a team parent who's gonna help collect all the information to make sure that we've got all the information necessary prior to bringing your binder to be verified. Again, the age and residence requirement. There's your school enrollment form, three forms of documentation. All right. If we're going to add a player, so we cross out, or sorry, we're going to strike through the player that they're replacing. Again, no whiteout, just strike through the player's name. And then down below, you'll see a spot where you can put a player replacement. Um, there are initials here where it says district administrator approval. That's where the district or an ADA or representative of D4 is going to come and verify that new player. All right. Okay, we have a couple of questions here. Okay. Um, pitching records are often incorrectly filled out when they get to me. Can you go over the correct handling of each part of the form? Of the pitching affidavit? Uh, uh, either pitching affidavit or pitching record, I would assume, from TOC Future Stars. All right, for TOC and Future Stars, the, the record, um, uh, not quite sure what we mean by incorrectly filled out, but um, it provides the day of the game, the level of play, and forgive me, because I'm doing this from memory. Um, uh, the threshold reached. Uh, threshold reach is probably where there's most the most of the questions. Um, um, in there, it'll say, I think, 25, 50, um, something, and then 65. Um, what that is, is if, for example, a pitcher is pitching and they start a batter at 24 pitches and they complete, complete that batter at 27 pitches, the threshold that they reach, you would circle 25 and the pitch is thrown, you would put 27. But that means that they're eligible for the no rest um, category for um, pitching limits. Um, if they started a new batter at 27 pitches, then they are, you would have to circle the next um, uh, threshold level, which would be the one day of rest. Um, let me think what the next spot be. Um, next um, eligible pitching date. Um, if for example, today is the fifth, and um, I pitched 
and I have four days of rest. My four days starts tomorrow. So I would be available six, seven, eight, nine. I'm not available to the ninth. Four days, no, sorry, the 10th, four days of rest. Um, player name, player number, player age. Um, and then I believe it's manager's initials and then TD's initials. Okay, I would I would just add that on the first game of uh, TOC's uh, Future Stars that the uh, league president is going to essentially be initialing if there are any restrictions. If it's blank, that means there are no, are no restrictions. And then after that, it will only be TDs, correct? Correct. We'll be filling that out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, please address what uh, what one should do if the pitching record is missing. Um, Ted, I'll let you handle that. But if the pitching record is missing, we're not doing the one pitcher a game or one pitcher. Nope. Pitching record's missing. They can't play. TLC, it would be a forfeit all-star game. It would go to the tournament committee to decide how we would handle the game. Oh, sorry. Uh, Ted, if I can keep you on here for a moment. Uh, we have some more questions about the live streaming and what is the uh, policy on live streaming? Again, you need to get permission from both teams because you're broadcasting youth faces across the world so it, it you would need to get permission from all the parents of every player from both teams okay what if the game is just being recorded say by a family who just wants to watch it for their own selves it, yeah it's the same thing if they're if they're trying to put it up on the fence to record the whole game you still have to get permission from both from both teams um, I would also add to that, that those that are attaching cameras and they get pretty darn elaborate with attaching their cameras, um, those cameras cannot impede the vision of the, the field of view for the scorekeepers or the announcers or in any way, shape or form be in the way of the umpires. Okay. The tournament verification form is a data center generated form, correct? Correct. Okay. Do we no longer put a copy of the manager coach's driver's license in the binder? No, we've said it several times. You can you can put photocopies in the binder. It's actually preferred for me as a TD. I want to be able to see all three in one spot. Okay. Oh, so everybody. Throw Okay, um, we have some more issues with live streaming, but um, they're adding links, uh, Little League links. Uh, so just know that there are um, resources on the littleleague.org site. Liz, that's all we have for now. All right, here we go. The playing rules. Um, again, TOC games are played under um, little League official playing rules. Um, no local league rules apply. Um, interleague playing rules are found on the softball and baseball websites of District 4 web, uh, sorry, on the District 4 website. Um, the only change for TOC is that time limits are eliminated for all divisions of baseball and softball. So there are no time limits in TOC. Um, there we go. That's where we find them. Thank you. Um, all right. There's our interleague player rules for 60, 60 foot diamonds and teenage baseball rules. Ooh, 60 inch diamonds. Cool. Um, let's see. And our 2023 league rules, softball, pitching rules. All right. In all divisions of TOT except seniors, a mandatory play tracker will be kept during the game by the scorekeepers. Managers are still required to give, give the scorekeepers each defensive half inning which players are sitting in that inning. Once all players on the team have met their defensive mandatory play requirements of six defensive outs, um, the log will no longer be kept. Uh, 
Oh, in minor divisions, a five run half inning equals three defensive outs. Right. This is a new requirement. So this is new. We want to make sure that we're using it. Um, because we have continuous batting order now, we got to make sure that we're still, um, that players are still meeting their minimum play. Hanging in there, you guys are doing great. All right, all star play. Um, no local or interleague rules, manager or, or manager agreements are allowed in the all star tournaments. Um, ground rules for field for fields do apply and must review to the plate. All right, these are the following key rules, unless noted by an exception, apply to all divisions of play. All right. Um, if you played all stars or were a TD last year, the number of coaches was determined. Another number of coaches allowed was determined by how many players are on the team. Um, that rule has been eliminated. Um, whether a team has nine players or fourteen players, um, you still can have a manager and two coaches on the team. Um, uh, however, number of players a game may not begin or continue with fewer than nine players. Uh, also new for this this season of um, All Star Play is all divisions, juniors and below, have continuous batting order. All right. Um, the start of the game, all players will be in uh, be uh, on the pitch. Oh my gosh, lost it on the uh, lineup card. Thank you. Um, so uh, D four has created a uh, new um, lineup cards to accommodate all the players um, for uh, there are no defensive mandatory play requirements. Players may be entered or re-entered defensively anytime. An improper batter with, will be considered as a batting out of turn and any late arriving players. And if the manager chooses will be added to the end of the batting order. It's not a requirement for a player to arrive late or after the lineup cards have been um, handed in. It's not required that the manager put them in the game. All right. A player must leave the game will have that place in the batting order skipped over with no out recorded. Uh, this will probably come up a lot. So make sure that you're aware of that rule. Um, the player may return and will go back into the original batting order spot. Um, that and help me with this one, Jim, because I know it's come up a lot. Um, that includes a, a, a player who's injured and needs to skip their turn in the lineup because of an injury. Um, hopefully they're planning potty breaks a little better um, at this level, but that includes a, a potty break where players can get back in time as well. That is correct. Okay. Um, a player unable to complete a plate appearance due to ejection, injury, or illness will not have will have next player in batting order take his or her spot and assume the existing count. So if a player goes down with a two and one count, has to leave the game, the next player comes up and assumes that count. All right, a batter who reaches base and is unable to, to run the bases due to injury, illness, or ejection will be replaced by the manager who made the last out or, um, if eligible, a courtesy runner. All right, again, we're still in juniors and below. A batter reaching base for the first time in the game is not required to run the bases. A courtesy runner can be used in this instance. I believe the same rule applies, though. You can't use a courtesy runner more than once for the same player in that game. Uh, no, it's uh, because it's continuous batting order. It may be that with two outs, um, uh, the last out just happens to be the same player. So, uh, yes. Uh, can the player be run for, though? And what do you mean by run for? Um, can the, the batter runner can be, um, have a courtesy runner replaced, replace him more than once in a game? Yes, they can. They can actually not run the bases at all with the new okay. rules. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, a courtesy runner is allowed for the pitcher or catcher. This is not a special pinch runner. This is a courtesy runner, um, when there's two outs, um, so if there's two outs, the player uh, who made the last out can be uh, the runner for the pitcher or catcher. 
All right. Senior softball, still batting just nine. There is no mandatory play. Um, starters may re-enter the game in the same spot in the batting order. Non-starter substitute is not allowed to re-enter the game. There are no courtesy runners and a special pinch runner allowed twice per game. All right, baseball pitching rules. Um, maximum number of pitches in a day. Um, it, in our TD bucket, we also have the, um, the list of ages and uh, maximum uh, innings and or pitches allowed per player by age. Um, good to have in there for your uh, filling out the pitching affidavit as well as for your um, scorekeepers. All right. Same as regular season rules, catcher to pitcher, pitcher to catcher, pitching thresholds, consecutive days, and pitcher re-entry. For softball, calendar days of rest. If they pitch six innings or less, it's zero days. Seven innings or more, it's one day of rest. Maximum, maximum innings pitched per day is 12. Um, a player removed his pitcher but remains in the game defensively may return his pitcher any time of the game, but only once in the same inning as she was removed. And there's no limit to the number of pitchers used in a game. Uh, softball pitching rules, junior and seniors, there are no pitching restrictions. Um, same thing, player rem remaining in the game but moving to a different position can return as a pitcher any time, but only once in the same inning um, as she was removed. A pitcher withdrawn from the game defensively or offensively may return his pitcher once per inning, provided does not violate visits, mandatory play, or substitution rules, and no limits of number of pitchers used in a game. Uh, pitch, pitcher circle violation. When the pitcher has the ball in the pitcher circle and a runner is on base, that runner may not legally disengage from the base on the pitcher on the pitch until. Um, in the eight to 10 year old vision, the ball reaches the batter or is struck. And then in all other divisions, the pitcher releases the ball during the pitch. All right, future stars. All right, future stars play by the all star rules, eight to 10 and nine to 11, with the exception of two rules. Um, one is adults are allowed to warm up pitchers for future stars only. And the future stars protest rule is the TOC protest rule, meaning that the district, it stops at the district level. Almost there, you're there. All right, remember, establish a schedule, get help, get team leaders, um, make sure all the equipment for the grounds crews, scorekeepers, everything is, is secured and ready. Um, have that check-in list ready to go. Uh, check the D4, uh, uh, TOC and all-star schedules frequently. I would check them twice a day minimum um, before and after the game to make sure you know what's going on and know for what to check for when the teams arrive. Um, be prepared in the case of a protest, um, the difference between TOC and future star, TOC, future stars and all-stars. Um, make sure all participants conform to the dress code and decorum. Um, know the task required after each game. Remember the tournament handbook, have that handy, um, and then prepare for the next game. All right. Uh, key phone numbers, district administrators, Ted Boet, Western Region hang Headquarters, and uh, that information will be found in the, you said you're gonna send that out, right, Ted? The new phone, new phone number for West Region Headquarters? Correct. Okay. And then there's the UIC Val <clears throat> Waddell. If you'd like, um, if you need it, my phone number is a 510-701-8637. All right. Final round of questions. Okay, Liz. Uh, first to comment, uh, Ted Boet posted a statement on Little League streaming from the Little League uh, site on the chat. So if you want to look at the chat for that. Um, and maybe I can handle this question. Can you 
you clarify which levels of play and tournaments have continuous batting order in baseball. So juniors and below future stars, TOC and all stars will all use continuous batting order. The only level that will not in baseball is seniors. And that's the same for softball. Um, let's see. Yeah, still commenting about uh, digital streaming. So that's it, Liz. Okay, let's go. Let's give you guys some thank yous here. All right. Uh, thank you again for attending tonight's meeting. I know it's a long one. I know it's a lot of information. So if you have questions, um, email me. My information's on the District 4 website. Email me, call me. Um, uh, we're there to help. So um, again, you're welcome to come by my field. I'm going to be a TD for Saturday's game. Um, I believe it starts at 10 a.m. at the Olive Oliveira Field in Concord. I'm happy to uh, let you guys shadow and see how it all works. It's actually a lot of fun, so um, come on down. And our Snack Shack's open. All right. And congratulations, you passed the tournament director paint training. You're all official. Go forth and be TDs. Real quick, before everybody runs away, I'd like to thank you as well. It takes a lot of people to run both of the tournaments um we have 12 leagues and hundreds of games that we have to put on so without everybody's effort this becomes something of a uh, difficult situation in about a half an hour you'll get an email for everybody that registered for the course tonight it'll include the td booklet and a few other items uh, unless you hear back from me the protest number in the td booklet is correct they're not handing it out till tomorrow but over the past decade they haven't changed that number so i'm hoping it stays that way but if it does change, then I'll send everybody another email. So again, appreciate everything you do. Most important thing I need from everybody at the end of every game is to make sure you text the results because without that, nobody knows who they're playing in their next game and I don't know who won or lost. So that's great, would be greatly appreciated. Again, appreciate the efforts. Liz, we have one further question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can you make shadowing times available for TDs and future ones? Uh, meaning my own, my personal schedule? I think that's what that means. Yeah, I tell you what, I'm going to type it one more time while you guys are there. And my information's um, uh, also on the District 4 website, but give me a call. And if you want to come shadow another time, I'm happy to be there. Um, Rick's also done it a number of times. He's our league president. Um, so he's another good guy to uh, shadow if you need. Okay, and just a final comment in chat. You got a lot of thanks, Liz, and great, uh, thank and great <laughs> presenter. Thanks, guys. All right, we'll see you out there. Oh, there you are.